So <clears throat> when we begin to slow down, then perhaps we remember how speedy the day has been. Uh, most likely quite speedy for many people. Maybe not uh, venerable in Montana, but uh, for us Deliwalas, probably uh, quite quite hectic one way or another. And also hectic uh, in terms of the inner workings of the mind, uh, meaning a lot of thoughts, a lot of planning, a lot of uh, ascertaining this and that, remembering <clears throat> all, all kinds of mental events happening one after another. This is our chance to uh, enjoy what a little bit like a, an oasis in the midst of a desert-like situation. So we can begin to come back home to the uh, peace of the natural mind when it's left alone and it's not stirred up with uh, this, that, and the other. And uh, there was a famous um, American uh, cartoonist, author, probably people don't know the name now, James Thurber. And in one of his uh, drawings, he has uh, people rushing up and down, rushing, rushing, rushing up and down. You can see them speedily going here and there. And in the background, <laughs> of course, in the background, there's a cemetery. <clears throat> and uh, one is reminded of that very often. Whenever I come to Toshita now in the evenings from home, short walk, then I have to come within a few feet of the main uh, uh, north-south artery here, um, Urbindo Mark, and it is chock-a-block with traffic. Uh, motorcyclists trying to avoid the main traffic and going whizzing down a side road. Uh, cars also attempting that. So there's this sense of tremendous speed and rush and impatience and people frantic to get home, where I guess they uh, pretty much flop exhausted in a chair or on a bed and uh, turn on their, their devices or watch other devices to relax. And many of them have to <laughs> perhaps go back to not very, not very welcoming accommodation or even people. So, yeah, there's that sense of uh, deep unsatisfactoriness that naturally occurs when one is in such a hurry, so speedy. The 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 kind of opposite end of the spectrum from being at ease, relaxed, in a more natural setting, which would have been the human experience for, yeah, since the beginning, really, until the advent of perhaps the Industrial Revolution and so forth, uh, much more, less speed. <clears throat> Anyway, that's just one way of beginning to look at the human predicament, the, what Buddha would have called the uh, truth of suffering. Which is of course very vast, as you know. 
which includes the uh, both the, the very fact that our body and mind are the product of karma and delusion. These are uh, tainted, contaminated aggregates controlled by delusion and karma. So that is the deepest sort of level of uh, unsatisfactoriness. So for now, you could say we are uh, programmed to suffer. You could put it that way. Programmed to have uh, unsatisfactory experience of body and mind. Unsatisfactory is a euphemism also. We could say painful, sometimes extremely painful experiences of body and mind. And this is shared by everybody on this planet and throughout the universe, apparently, one way or another. Who knows, there may be higher intelligences on other planetary systems or galaxies, but uh, un unless they have developed genuine wisdom and compassion, they will also be suffering. If they have consciousnesses, they will be suffering. So we're very fortunate. We have this opportunity as human beings, we're still alive. And all you have to do is look at photographs of people you loved who are now dead, or videos. And you realize that, um, <clears throat> yeah, death is that, uh, death is waiting for all of us. And it will occur at some kind of unknown time. So, <clears throat> well, we have the time. We should, uh, we can sometimes recall the words of uh, great uh, practitioners of the past, such as, for example, Melarepa, who said that we should um, toss to the winds our concern for this life and bring to our minds the unknown time of our death. And he asks, you know, remembering the pain of samsara, why long for the unnecessary? Why long for the unnecessary? So we can uh, begin to investigate what might be really necessary, what is unnecessary. Just as when a person is uh, preparing for a long travel, uh, maybe travel, which is say on foot. So then they are careful to take exactly what is needed and not more than what is needed since they will be carrying everything with them. So when we die, we carry our longings and our aspirations, our states of mind, our habitual patterns with us. So uh, I guess Miller Epa is saying we should um, check carefully what is necessary, what we would do well to leave behind. <clears throat> Uh, 
the main thing it seems according to the text we are studying the main thing to leave behind the unnecessary thing is the uh, self-cherishing attitude the uh, great devil the great demon he says what use is that great devil that great demon to me the, uh, selfish self-cherishing attitude cause of all my suffering based on the cognitive error of self-grasping ignorance. <clears throat> so spend some time reflecting on motivation. It's very important. I think that uh, by participating in the session, we are like sick people who are come to the doctor for the, for the medicine or the dharma, which is the only way to be free of the sickness. So, in order to develop a state of mind which is able to navigate the treacherous ocean of samsara, we need to create clarity, calm, kindness, deep wisdom within this mind. So, to that end, we first practice the stabilizing meditation. Work with the breath. <clears throat> so, cultivating a good posture, please. You're all familiar with. Please uh, sit together quietly for 10 minutes. Remember, essence of this is stillness and relaxation and attentiveness. 
sense of letting go with the out breath. Attentive to what is arising in the mind. When thoughts come, we gently let them go. Come back to the breath. Not rejecting anything, but not holding on to anything either. Just letting go back to the breath. We touch the breath. We don't cling to the breath either. It's not something to cling to or grasp at. Simply a temporary measure, process, or by skillful means.
Okay. So we had some very powerful uh, verses on Tuesday, such as verse 137, where Shantideva made it very clear what the attitude was to be, is to be, and that's the attitude to be aimed at. I am under the control of others. Of this mind, you must be certain. Now, except for benefiting every creature, you must not think of anything else. He really couldn't make it much clearer than that, could he? You know? And then he says, for my sake, I shouldn't do anything with these eyes and so forth, which I have left at the disposal of others. It's quite incorrect to do anything with them, which is contrary to the benefit of others. Thus, sentient beings should be my main concern. Whatever I behold upon my body, I should rob and use for the benefit of others. This is very unusual. This would be regarded as uh, insane in one sense by uh, so-called normal society. Uh, of course, normal is often very abnormal and sick and rotten. In the words of Krishnamurti, he would say it is rotten, rotten society he often talks about, um, <clears throat> which is not to mean that he is against society, but he's saying the present society is uh, riddled with uh, violence and so forth. Um, just looking at them. Therefore, becoming subservient to sentient beings and snatching away whatever you see on this body, use it for the well being of others. Hmm. Verse 140. Considering lesser beings and so forth as myself. And considering myself as the other, in the following way, I should meditate upon envy, competitiveness, and self-importance with a mind free of distorted concepts. So now what's going to happen from this verse until verse uh, 154 is that um, it's going to be a practice of uh, putting oneself in the role of others, yeah, exchanging self for others. So I and other are literally being reversed here. So when we, I, in the following stanza, should be understood as all other sentient beings, he, when they refer to he, uh, is talking about oneself, myself. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a meditation on envy from verses 141 to 146, that is on envy. Then uh, uh, 147 to 150 is competitiveness. And 151 to 154 is uh, self-importance. Self-importance. Okay, so let's see. This is an interesting uh, kind of exercise, uh, mind experiment. Uh, so, <clears throat> he is honored, but I'm not. So he refers to me and the person speaking is others, right? He is honored, but I'm not. I've not found wealth such as he. He is praised. I am despised. He is happy, but I suffer. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so there's the sense of envy coming up, right? I have to do all the work. He remains comfortably at rest. He is renowned as great in this world, but I as inferior, with no good qualities at all. But what do you mean I have no good qualities? I have all good qualities. Compared to many, he is inferior. Compared to many, I am high. 
the deteriorated state of my morals and views is not due to me, but due to my disturbing conceptions. In whatever way he is able, he should heal me. Willingly, I shall accept any discomfort involved. Much love, others are taking the viewpoint of another person looking at oneself who is advantaged and has, you know, more resources and so forth. That person is saying, look, I should actually help others. This person, uh, oneself, should help others who are, who are uh, you know, suffering due to their disturbing conceptions and so on and so forth. I will, uh, you know, accept this person's help. In other words, my help. Others will accept my help. But what happens? I'm not being healed, healed by him. I'm not being healed by him. Maslav, I'm actually not doing anything for others. That is what others are saying about me. I'm, I'm, I'm not helping them, even though they need help. So why does he belittle me? What use are his good qualities to me? You know, I think I have good qualities. The other person is saying, what good are my good qualities? You know, I'm not even helping others. Although he has good qualities, he does not benefit me. Yeah, although he has good qualities, he does not benefit me. <clears throat> With no compassion for the beings who dwell in the poisonous mouth of harmful realms, externally he is proud of his good qualities and wishes to put down the wise. Yeah, that's what others may be thinking about me. Yeah. And that's maybe how I behave. No compassion for others who are, you know, having, who are on the verge of falling into the lower realms due to their negativities, you know. And uh, yet still I'm proud of myself, you know, proud of myself. I even put down wise people. So this is what the other person is seeing in me. And which, much of which is very correct, perhaps, yeah. Now, verse 147, this is starting the uh, section on um, competitiveness. Four verses on competitiveness. <clears throat> In order that I may excel, he who is regarded as equal with me, in order that I may excel or go beyond he who is regarded as equal with me, I shall definitely strive to attain material gain and honor for myself, even by such means as verbal dispute. So I'm going to compete with this person, you know, who thinks they're so great, you know, who think they're better than me. What the mind of envy, uh, sorry, competitiveness thinks, you know, that's how that mind thinks. Um, <clears throat> seeing himself as being equal to others in order to enhance his own superiority, he will obtain wealth and respect for himself, even by means of discord. Hmm. Yeah, it's actually uh, referring to some <clears throat> bachelor has a different translation entirely. He is putting that in the uh, words in the mouth of I, not he. In order that I make so. Mm -hmm. seeing himself as being equal to others. He who is regarded as equal to me. Mm -hmm. I shall definitely strive to attain material gain and honor for myself. He will obtain more for me. How do you see that sentence? <clears throat> Were my good qualities to become apparent to everyone in the world, then no one would even hear of his good quality. By all means, I shall make clear to the entire world all the good qualities I have, but I shall not let anyone hear of any good qualities he may have. Hmm. This is how the mind of competitiveness thinks. I shall hide all my faults. I'll be venerated, but not he. I'll find a great deal of material gain. I'll be honored, but he shall not. Were my faults, in the other translation, were my faults, were my faults to be concealed, 
there would be honor for me and not for him. Today I have easily acquired possessions. I am honored while he is not. Delighted, we shall watch him as he is finally being ill-treated, ridiculed, and reviled from all sides. Goodness me. <clears throat> Not a very happy state of mind, is it? This is exactly what we sometimes feel. Then, the self-importance, verse 151. <clears throat> I like the uh, Wallace translation here, which you don't have. Also, it seems this wretched one is competing with me. Does he have this much learning, wisdom, beauty, noble ancestry, and wealth? Uh, bachelor's translation. It is said that this deluded one is trying to compete with me. But how can he be equal with me in learning, intelligence, form, class? or wealth. Let's see what um, all along um, Prima Chodron has been saying in her commentary. <clears throat> we haven't looked at that for a while, uh, <clears throat> quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, People say this pitiful non-entity is trying to compete with me. How can he resemble me, they ask, in learning, beauty, wealth, or pedigree? Just to hear them talk about my qualities, my reputation on the lips of all, the thrill of it sends shivers down my spine, the pleasure that I bask and revel in. Granted, even if he does have something, I'm the one he's working for, he can keep enough just to survive, but with my strength, I'll steal away the rest. I will wear his happiness away. I will always hurt and injure him. He's the one who in samsara did me mischiefs by the hundreds. Wow. We should deprive him of happiness and always yoke him to our anguish. We all have been afflicted in the cycle of existence hundreds of times by him much love by me. Uh, even though he has some possessions, if he's working for me, I shall give him just enough to live on and by force I'll take the rest. His happiness and comfort will decline and I shall always cause him harm. For hundreds of times in this cycle of rebirth, he has caused harm to me. So let's read what uh, Pema Chodron says about this. In verses 151 to 154, these last uh, four verses we've looked at, Shantideva changes places with someone who looks down on him, someone who finds him unworthy of attention. He allows himself to experience full-blown arrogance, as well as being on the receiving end of that degree of scorn and condescension. So in this practice, you get to play all the roles and use your own words to make the situation personal and real. So let's say I'm a homeless person and there's Prima Chodron walking by with all her good fortune. What if she treated me as a human being instead of just giving me money? What if she asked how I was doing or where I was going to sleep that night? In a relationship between two equal human beings, both the unfortunate person's resentment and Pema's indifference have a chance to melt away. With the last two lines in verse 154, Shantideva begins a dialogue with a fearful, uptight mind of self-absorption. Matlab, he's the one who in samsara did me mischiefs by the hundreds. A very fearful, uptight mind of just being concerned with oneself, what people have done to me, what they haven't done, blah, blah, blah. Next verse, 
he plays two roles, Shantideva. His innate wisdom talks sense to his confused neurotic self. We all have this guiding wisdom mind, and like Shantideva, we can call on it any time. Matlab 155, it takes a different tack, doesn't it? Because of desiring to benefit yourself, O oh mind, all weariness you have gone through over countless past eons has only succeeded in achieving misery. O oh my mind, what countless ages have you spent in working for yourself? And what a great weariness it was, while your reward was only misery. Yeah. Beginningless lives, mainly working only for ourselves. We haven't spent many lives dedicated to others. It's mainly dedicated to ourselves. And look where it's brought us, he's saying. It's only achieved in bringing us confusion, misery. We're not yet contented, happy human beings, despite our intelligence, you know our cleverness. Therefore, now he says, therefore, I shall definitely engage myself in working for the benefit of others. For since the words of the mighty one are infallible, I shall behold its advantages in the future. I shall behold the advantages of working for others. I shall have those advantages. I shall reap those advantages in the future. If in the past I had practiced this action of exchanging myself for others, a situation such as this, devoid of the magnificence and bliss of a Buddha, could not possibly have come about. Matlab, I'm in this mess because I didn't practice the exchange of self with others before. If indeed you had in former times embraced this work and undertaken it, you could not still be lacking in the perfect bliss of Buddhahood. <clears throat> so he's saying, uh, he's talking to his neurotic, confused mind. You know, it's like saying, if you'd started on this path even a month ago, then you'd be that much closer to Buddhahood. So then he goes over some material that he looked at before in this chapter. Just as you identify a drop of others' blood and sperm and cling to it as though it were yourself, now take sentient beings, others, as yourself. Now be covetous for others' sake. Of everything you see that you possess, steal it, take it all away, use it for the benefit of others. Matlab, steal from yourself. Excuse me. Having thoroughly examined myself to see whether I'm really working for others or not, I shall steal whatever appears on my body and use it for the benefit of others. <laughs> no, maybe not in this cold weather, but yeah, if we have extra clothes, maybe we could give some away. For sure. So much of what we do builds up selfishness, destroys our happiness. Exchanging ourselves with others brings contentment into our lives. It's as simple as that, says Prema Chodron. Herbert Gunther who was an early famous uh, Buddhist commentator. He was more connected with Arthan um, Tulku and I think Jogim Trungpa to some extent. Herbert Gunther uh, defines ego as a fictitious self. Here, this fictitious self is being advised by the wisdom mind to free itself and benefit others by whatever means possible. If your neurotic tendency is to steal, then turn stealing into benefit for others. In order to be free of covetousness, imagine stealing whatever your fictitious self is most attached to, and then giving that to those in need. This is a unique instruction for escaping the trap of self-centered grasping then a rather uh, amusing word, verse, 160. I am happy, others are sad. I am high, others are low. I benefit myself, but not others. Why aren't I envious of myself? <laughs> I indeed am happy, others are sad. I am high and mighty, others low. I am helped while others are abandoned. Why aren't I jealous of myself? 
161, happiness, fulfillment. These I leave aside. The pain of others, this I will embrace. Inquiring of myself repeatedly, I will become aware of all my faults. I, shall, I must separate myself from happiness, take upon myself the suffering of others. Why am I doing this now? In this way, I should examine myself for faults. This is very much, of course, remember throughout this, he's talking to the pundits and mainly monks, monastics of Nalanda when he gave this amazing teaching. And uh, the monastic practice, of course, in the Vinaya, the uh, rules for the monks, is that um, you don't, you know, if you've decided, for example, that you want to go out of the room to do something, you should know why you're going out, you know, where you're going, why you're going, how you're going. You shouldn't just walk out and not know what you're doing or do it in, you know, a fashion which is um, unbecoming of a monastic. It, it should be dignified. One should know what's going on. One should watch one's mind for any wrong motives, you know. One shouldn't suddenly veer off and, you know, go towards the market when you are planning to go and, you know, recite some prayers in the prayer hall. You shouldn't decide that you need a chai or something, you know. Um, one should stick to what one has decided and what one has decided should be in consonance with uh, the monastic, and in this case, also bodhisattva way of life, which is asking a lot of the deluded self-cherishing mind, that's for sure, but there's no other way. Doesn't mean you can't sometimes go for a cup of tea, but of course, even that depends. If you're a monastic in a monastery, you can't go for a cup of tea just any time you like. Although in some monasteries, maybe you can, but where the discipline is proper, you have tea at particular times, you know? can't just go off and have a cup of tea when you want. So anyway, or well you can't, and, but of course the main thing here is that we keep on having thoughts, don't we? Flickering thoughts of envy, jealousy, lust, anger, uh, uh, you know, envy, criticizing, putting others down just in our mind, a thought can come. So we have to be aware of them as well, not allow them to keep repeating themselves and become a habit. So why am I doing this now? It doesn't, I think, just refer to actions of the body. It's actions of body and mind. Yeah. Why am I doing this now? In this way, I should examine myself for thought. And for sure, this is one of the hardest things to practice. Very hard to practice in this twittering, what's upping age. One has to be very careful. Although others may do something wrong, I should transform it into a fault of my own. But should I do something even slightly wrong, I shall openly admit it to many people. Again, you have to be careful here. You shouldn't go around proclaiming all your faults to anybody because, you know, then other people may completely lose faith in you. On the other hand, if we keep on concealing our faults and not declaring it to anybody, then those faults can increase, right? So of course, that's the main logic behind uh, confession that you have some faith in the Buddha and your teachers. And when you do the confession practice, you realize, you know, the Buddha knows what's going on. Your teacher is aware of what's happening. You know, you are wholeheartedly confessing something, um, revealing it, and um, <clears throat> the Buddha's know. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have to, you know, be skillful with this. Mm. But it certainly makes sense, uh, as the Bible says, not to, uh, it certainly makes sense not to uh, come, you know, keep on criticizing others and not seeing one's own faults. Because it's very easy to do that then. Uh, in fact, it's often quite funny one projects one's own faults onto others and criticizes them for it. This I've seen in others very clearly and uh, try to see that in myself. But sometimes it's very humorous seeing it in others. I used to see it with certain people, certain family members, criticizing other people. And you know, that person is suffering from that fault. They're criticizing you, no, you're 
you're guilty of that, you know, when it's so clear that that person is guilty of it as well, or even more. Anyway, um, <clears throat> what does the Bible say? Don't, you know, look at the, uh, something about uh, not criticizing others because you have a big beam in your own eye, but you're criticizing, you know, the dust in others' eyes, but you have a big beam in your own eye. And, um, you know, those who are without sin, let them cast the first stone. So if you're so convinced you are so pure, completely pure, then okay, go ahead and cast your verbal stones at others or whatever. But, you know, who is without some kind of mistake or sin? You know? <clears throat> anyway, this is something not unique to Buddhism. All, all the religions know about this one. But uh, whether you should openly admit your faults to many people, I'm not sure about that. It depends on the degree of the fault and also the effect it'll have. If you're really, I suppose, a great yogi who doesn't care and who doesn't have a position of responsibility, say, in an organization, then, then you can you know, put yourself down as much as you want because you live in a cave, maybe mostly, or somewhere far away from people uh, you don't need people to respect you, maybe. And the people who respect you because they know you very well, your whatever students or, or fellow uh, workers, uh, not fellow workers, fellow meditators, they're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, upset if you talk about your faults. I mean, they might even think it's a good quality. But we have to be careful with this one. We ordinary people have to be careful with this one. Don't go around proclaiming all your faults to everyone. Uh, they won't be impressed or they'll think you're just showing off, trying to be very humble and so forth. So we have to be careful. But his point is, don't hide one's faults and, you know, um, don't just pick on other people. see it as your own fault even. Although others may do something wrong, I should transform it into a fault of my own. I'm wondering how Wallace translates this. Hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, take the mistake made by another on your head and disclose even a trivial mistake of yours to the great sage. Hmm, he doesn't say to many people. Okay, what's the actual Tibetan? Because he's saying he has, he translates in this very, very interesting translation, by the way, uh, which is a, a Snowline publication, uh, Vesna and Alan Wallace together. So anyway, he translates the Tibetan for that verse uh, as follows. Um, Take the blame yourself for others' mistakes. Oh, okay. And if you commit even a small misdeed, confess it to many people. Hmm, that does say many people. So I'm wondering why. Okay, maybe there are two trans. He maybe he's there are several translations here yeah, of this text. Different translations have come down over the ages, and um, the translation. His main translation is even. Disclose even a trivial mistake of yours to the great sage, Matlab, just to the Buddha. The introduction would make that clear, I guess. Uh, he's probably being a human, his wife being good um, scholars, they uh, are referring to different editions of the translation. Mm. Anyway. Those who are interested can look at different translations. Uh, we are on verse 162. And the Padmakara, Padmakara translation is, when others are at fault, I'll take and turn the blame upon myself and all my sins, however slight, declare and make them known to many. Again, it's many. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, you can try this, but I want us to be cautious with this one, I think. 
but then, you know, <laughs> I'm always trying to hide my fault. So, so we have to yeah, check. 163, by further describing the renown of others, I should make it outshine my own. Just like the lowest kind of servant, I should employ myself for the benefit of all. <laughs> so Lama Zulp Rinpoche said once uh, in his little wonderful little booklet, which is also an expanded version on, uh, you know, bodhicitta, bodhicitta attitude. He says that in centers, people have come to him and complain saying other people are using me. Yeah, okay, other people are using me. And he said, uh, in, in the commentary says, you know, that's what we're trying to do, right? We want people to use us. That's our purpose, you know, to be used by people. What else do you want? You just want to be a spare tire or something, always sitting in the boot, you know? You want to be on that road, you know, taking the uh, bumps and everything kind of thing. So, yeah, but again, being used by others in English has the negative connotation, doesn't it? It's pejorative. He's using me. It's like we're being uh, used, we're being uh, exploited by others. So again, there we have to be careful. We have to be very careful. And of course, in all these practices, we shouldn't try and do more than we can right now, too much, you know. So we don't go and lie down next to hungry tigresses, right? And slit our throats with a knife and allow her to, you know, lick our blood and because we probably can't do that without fear and um, loathing even after a while. You know, we might think we can do it, but as soon as we see our own blood, we might become very upset. <clears throat> or maybe the tiger has bad breath. So then, you know, we, we get put off and then we die with a negative mind and it's no good. In the Sutra Golden Light, when it describes Mahasattva, I'm sure he didn't die with disgust. He died with delight, with joy, that he could help the tigress and her cubs, as well as create the cause for Buddhahood, more and more causes for Buddhahood. But I don't think we can do that right now. Okay, but just we can pretend to be a servant sometimes, you know? We can pretend, we can fake it sometimes. We can against our, you know, against our uh, habitual pattern, we might sometimes agree to make somebody a cup of tea, you know, instead of always expecting, you know, the servant or the maid to make us a cup of tea, we can sometimes make somebody a cup of tea, that's or something, you know. But often one finds in India, there's so much hierarchy, hierarchical sense that it's certain people sweep, certain people clean the toilet, Certain people do this and that, and one just does what one thinks one should do, you know, according to one's place in the hierarchy. I find that very difficult. But then I've lived in England, so it's a bit different. <clears throat> Although also a class-ridden society, but uh, I mean, I didn't live in Buckingham Palace, so I didn't have people, you know, treating me like they must be treating King Charles right now. <clears throat> Okay, 164, I should not praise my naturally fault-written self for some temporary good quality it may have. I shall never let even a few people know of any good qualities I may possess. Yeah, I, I'm just, yeah. Temporarily, we may have a good quality and then we want to, you know, proclaim it. Oh, you know, today I did this, I did that. This ego is by nature rife with faults. It's accidental gifts I should not praise. Whatever qualities it has, I'll so contrive that they remain unknown to everyone. This reminds me of Pachal Rinpoche, that wonderful, wonderful great Bodhisattva teacher of the uh, 19th century. Who would go around looking like a tramp, yeah, and people would uh, employ him as their servant and then have their minds blown when they realized he was a great teacher when they would see him sitting on a throne teaching. But you know, some people employed him as their servants because they thought he, you know, he was just a servant looking for work. 
So he had no heirs. He didn't wear fine clothing. He didn't go around on a horse with, with his uh, sidekicks, with his uh, you know entourage attendant. He would travel alone, and people would think he's just a beggar or a, you know a servant. And that's what he regarded himself as, as a great bodhisattva. He was a servant of others. Mm. Patrul Rinpoche, who's written extraordinary works, including uh, Words of My Perfect Teacher, yeah? Lam Rim of the uh, Nyingma tradition. Uh, in brief, in brief, for the sake of living creatures, may all the harms I have selfishly caused to others descend upon me myself. Of course, we've harmed others and we will. According to karmic law, we will suffer as a result. If we haven't purified. That's going to happen if we haven't purified. And if we have purified, but not perfectly, there will be some harm we will have to go through. Um, for example, it said that, um, you say we've done something really bad and we purified pretty well, but not perfectly. Then the result could be instead of the hell realms, we could have a bad headache or we could get shouted at by somebody or, or something small, relatively small could happen to us. I mean, relatively less painful. We wouldn't have the incredible suffering of um, you know, disease or, or harmful death or hell realm or something like that. But yeah, we are going to uh, suffer as a result of harming others. And here he's saying, um, may they ripen on me, may other people's um, in, for the sake of living creatures, may all the harms I've selfishly caused to others descend upon me. I will take them upon myself. I will willingly bear them. Of course, the bodhisattvas go further. They take the negative. They try to even take on the negative karma of others upon themselves. You know, okay, I will suffer so you don't have to suffer. You know, like a mother doing that for her only child. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll just do one more verse and then have some discussion. Verse 166, I should not be dominating and aggressive, acting in a self-righteous, arrogant way. Instead, like a newly married bride, I should be bashful, timid, and restrained. So again, this is not music to the ears of certain Feminists, I guess, right? <laughs> this music to your ears, uh, Namita? Haji? Seems like a bit, uh, I was just thinking about it. You were thinking about it. Do not let it strut about the place. So arrogant, so overbearing, but like a newly wedded bride, let it be demure and blushing, timorous and shy. talking about the ego. Mm. The point is just, you know, keep a low profile. You know, don't go around proclaiming, you know, I'm from Harvard, MPhil, BA, MPhil, PhD, da, 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 I've done this, that, and the other. You know, every time you introduce yourself to someone, you have to introduce all your credentials. We don't need to be like that. And we don't need to be aggressive. self-righteous, arrogant. Some people, sometimes we can be like that, right? Especially if we have a position, especially if we have certain uniform. Sometimes wearing a uniform can be a problem. We should just be kind of, yeah. It's actually very interesting to sometimes just sit on the sidelines and watch. Actually very interesting. When you're in a group, when you're in the market, in the market you can sit. I find it amazing in Bodhgaya to sit in the market, just watch so many different kinds of people go by. It's amazing. Local people, local richer people, local poor people, beggars. Then you have the tourists from different countries. You have the Tibetans. You have the Indian tourists, you know, from Bengal. You have the educated Indian tourists. You have the, oh, it's fascinating to watch sentient beings and then to try and develop a sense of, you know, I don't know, some kind of empathy for all of them because they all have their, 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 I'm sure their individual difficulties and sufferings, you know. 
And then when you're in a room with people, then that's interesting because then you can uh, see one's own self-consciousness there, which you don't see in the market because you're just hanging out, having a chai, right? And watching other people. But in a room where you're with other people or with your peers or with some people you know, some people you don't know, then it's very interesting to look at oneself and see how one's trying to maintain a certain, you know, posture. And I don't just mean physical posture. You know? And sometimes we're aggressive because we're, we feel very insecure, right? So we can be aggressive verbally. I found this. I found this with, with, with people I know. And sometimes it's quite disturbing. Then I've realized it's just because they are insecure. But they just keep on talking. Keep on talking. Don't let you. And when you start talking, they interrupt. I mean, why are they doing that? I think people, we do it because um, we feel insecure. Anyway, we shouldn't behave that way. We should be uh, timid, restrained, bashful. Maybe not like in the old, not like in the movies, the old movies. In the new, in the modern movies, I don't see much bashfulness. Do you? In the old movies, there's a lot of bashfulness. You know, kind of timid. Modern movies, not sure. Okay, let's have some discussion. I'll open it up. Sorry to keep you muted, all of you online. Very sorry. No, I'm not sorry, but I'm just saying I'm sorry. Uh, okay. What's going on? Take her. Anybody? Anybody want to comment on anything that we've looked at? Not just anything. Aha. Uh -huh. Hanji, anybody? Come on, all you intelligent uh, people. Ashwin, hello, long time no see. Vikramji. Oh, Yoav. Is that the Yoav I know? Maybe not. Yoav? Is that the Yoav I know who gave me a pair of socks at Dharapsala one time? Seeing the holes in my socks? No, I think that was you are Fisher. No, that's another you are. Okay, anyway, thank you, you are. One of your Israeli compatriots gave me a pair of socks once at Tushita when I was teaching at, uh, at uh, Tushita Center, Dharmsala. He saw I didn't have very good socks. He gave me a wonderful new pair of socks. And now I think he's a bodyguard for or he said he was going to be a bodyguard for one of the, what is it? The, I, these famous, these socialites beginning with K, Kash, Kash, what? Huh? Kardashian. Yeah, Kardashian, Kardashian. Thank you, people. So now he's maybe a bodyguard for Kardashian. <laughs> At that time, he was, he was giving me a pair of socks. Anyway, thank you, Yod. Where are you joining from? Can't hear you. You're muted. Have I muted everyone? No, I haven't. Oh, now you now you can hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm in Pushkar now. Oh, Pushkar, very nice. Goodness me. Very nice. What's it like in Pushkar? Now again, I have muted you or you've muted yourself. Anyway. You look quite uh, happy there. So anything to do with the text? Sorry, I created a diversion. <clears throat> Vikram? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Navinji? Kabizhi, I was just wondering about verse 162. Yeah. In that, um, the last line, I shall openly admit it to many people. We had a little bit of discussion already on that. Right. I was just... Uh, uh, both openly and many people seems to have uh, uh, possibilities of so in some exercises when we do visualization exercises we end up visualizing buddhas and bodhisattvas in front of us right and uh, the openly could uh, also mean you are with conscious effort uh, retrieve each of your faults which you see and you declare it to buddhas and bodhisattvas as an exercise uh, uh, to right. train the mind 
So right. uh, if you take that as an example, uh, uh, I can't uh, quite see why that is not expressly coming out. When you say many people by bachelor or openly, we could, uh, how come this translation, uh, the, uh, the commentaries which you're reading out, that is not coming out so clear as to include this, I mean. Uh, I think uh, it's very easy for us to openly admit it to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, actually, because they're not in the room with you. You're visualizing them. There are statues of them, but it's not as though they're like uh, people right in front of you, right? Although sometimes we do openly admit things to our teachers, whom we are supposed to see as uh, Bodhisattvas, Buddhas, and so forth. So uh, if, they, if Shantideva had wanted to say Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I think he would have said so. When you say many people in these kind of texts, you don't mean Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. You don't refer to them as many people. That would be very impolite. That's not his meaning. He mm. means to people around, you know, because what he's saying is we've harmed sentient beings, okay, by lying to them, by harming them, by doing all sorts of things to them since beginningless time, right? So here he's saying, do the opposite. Admit to them your faults. You've harmed every single one of them. According to Mahayana, right? You've harmed, you've been everyone's mother and father and God knows what, and you've harmed everybody. And you may have also benefited them to some extent, but you've harmed them more than you've benefited them, obviously, because they're still suffering and you're still suffering, right? So uh, admit it to them. It's that kind of attitude. Since you've harmed all of them, you've probably spoken harsh words to every single sentient being that exists. That kind of attitude, that kind of mind blowing idea is there. So uh, now admit it to everybody, at least mentally. So maybe he also means mentally. You admit it to the world, maybe to a few people personally, but you, you're kind of saying to the world, okay, I admit this is my fault. You know, I admit it kind of thing. But I don't think going around telling people of your faults is such a great idea. You, know, you can see how that would backfire. Richard? Um, Just a sec. Oh. Uh, hold on. Uh, have you finished? Then we can, can we? No, can I just uh, have a follow up sort of a? So um, I think finally the object is to train your mind, right? Uh, to be able to. So once we take that into account, if we are openly, not publicly, but openly in your mind, declaring your faults individually, mm -hmm. um. Uh, for uh, with respect to the vantage point of uh, training your mind, what is the mm. difference between openly declaring it to Buddhas and Buddhists in a visualization and also openly declaring to each person in a visualization exercise? Is there any essential difference for oh, training your mind? An essential difference. Both are great, but because of the power of the object, meaning the Buddhas, that it is more powerful to uh, engage in confession in connection with them. Otherwise, you would have practices where you're visualizing sentient beings and prostrating to them a hundred thousand times. I mean, that is good in one sense, but it's not the practice of, uh, you know, <coughs> purification through prostration. It is to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas because they are the more powerful object of uh, purification. But of course, uh, we should have this attitude, uh, it is said, to also be kind of prostrating and being a servant and serving others. Yeah. So in that sense, prostrating to them. But because of the power, karmic teaching say there's the power of the object, the most powerful are your parents and Buddhism bodhisattvas, okay? So harm incurred towards parents or Buddhist bodhisattvas or merit towards them is much more powerful. Because Sorry, of the power of if that is the case, huh. then uh, um, openly admitting it to many people uh, in terms of the general public would be less meritorious than openly admitting it to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Oh, yes, yes. And it would then, backfire, wouldn't it? If you uh, said it to many people, then you can imagine the Twittering campaign that will start, and then you will mm -hmm. get angry mm -hmm. and have to escape somewhere, you know? And it's for all well and good if you're already a yogi, but if you're not, it will just harm you. Harm your self-esteem, maybe harm your job, and harm your relations with other friends, and then parents will come down on top of you like a ton of bricks, then all kinds of things could happen. So yeah, it's much better to just do the practice of, you know, 
confession with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas or with Vajrasattva in terms of the mantra, uh, that is much better. That is why that is done, you know. So, you know, just if you go around everywhere confessing your faults to everybody, human beings here and there and everywhere, politicians and bank managers and everyone, and your friends, that is not the practice of confession. That is not going to get you. That's just going to get us trouble, right? <laughs> if you, you confess to the wrong people, they'll just use it against you, right? Mm -hmm. They will just, they will slaughter you. They will uh, crucify, they'll, they'll crucify you verbally. There's a very important call coming from Bodhgaya regarding Maitreya project, but I'll have to ignore it for the time being. Okay. Uh, so now, yeah, yeah. Was that all? Uh, yes, thank you, Kabir. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We said, can you be a little louder, please? Sorry. No, I will repeat it. Yeah. I will repeat it. I was wondering if, you know, it's also an opportunity that some they were saving us to check our ego. When we go and confess things that we are not comfortable sharing with people. Yeah. We, we sort of get, either we get embarrassed or we feel yeah. bad when we are yeah. sharing all of these things, right? Right. So it's also an opportunity for us to see our ego, like, to see how we feel when we are sharing all of these things. And then people is right in front of us. Sure. But would you do it with everybody? Or just yeah, one or two people? Who, who we are sharing this with. Uh, sorry? You have to be very skillful about whom you are sharing this yeah. with. Yeah. He's saying you have to be very skillful whom you're sharing it with, but it is an opportunity to see ego arise because he says, Vishad Bhai says, because who wants to, uh, you know, uh, confess their faults to people? You know, we don't. We want to hide them. So therefore, uh, if we do confess them to certain people, it's a way of um, overcoming the ego that you know doesn't want to confess it. You know? Yeah. Second point that you and can, the second point. Yeah. Yeah. It can be also progressive, right? But first, let's say we start with Buddha and Bodhisattva, mm. and then mentally we are probably sharing it with our close friends, and then you can really go out and talk to these friends. So progressively, you, are, you start sharing these things with different people, and then maybe at certain point in time where you you feel more confident or you're, you can see your ego is sort of coming in front of you and then you can slowly and steadily start sharing it with you I think you could start with the Buddhas confessing to them then confessing to your best friends you know and then more and more you could share it but I would counter to that that it should be a need to know basis why mm -hmm. confess your faults to people who it's not necessary to confess mm -hmm. it to mm -hmm. you know who would misuse it actually against you and then use it in a way that's not useful for your overall life you know it might be very good for your ego of course if the whole if the whole town the whole colony is uh, talking about you behind your back and you really want that kind of <laughs> uh, experience in order to uh, check your ego well all, you know by all means do it but um, i would be careful with that right now but maybe, uh, you know, I would be careful with that. So, yeah, I think one has to be quite judicious and um, see that the point is not to hide, not to conceal, and not to pretend to be something one is not. And that is so difficult. That is so difficult. Also not to pretend. Sharing and confessing. Yeah. There's no point sharing these things with people. Because Certain things, yeah, it's pointless. But then confession, what is the difference between, what's the difference between sharing and confessing? What's the difference between sharing and confessing? With confessing, you, there's a, well, if you look at the practices of Tibetan Buddhism and the way it is written and who you are confessing to, how you do it, uh, when you're sharing, you're just saying to a friend, look, I went and I, uh, you know, stole uh, 10 packets of, uh, you know, whatever, protein bar from the shop the other day, you know, and, it, and you're sharing it. But when you confess, you confess to the Buddhas, you know, with great regret and with a prostration or mantra. And there's a whole process, as you know, involving the four opponent paths. Yeah, so regret. Element of regret, right? 
has to be a strong element of regret for any confession, strong element of regret. Because when you share it with friends, you, you could also share in a way that is a little bit proud. You know, I, I was able to, you know, cheat the tax people of, uh, you know, 10 lakh rupees, which I owe them. That's sharing, but it's not confessing. I mean, it, it's not confessing in the sense of purifying the mistake. So there's a huge difference. Thieves and so forth share information about how to, you know, rob a bank or whatever they do. It's, uh, it's a totally different thing. Yeah. <clears throat> what else, folks? Whew. Ayesha, Ashwin, Rajesh, Nivita, Vikram, no. Venerable Kundral, anything? It is morning time in Montana, USA. Kabishi, I had one question. You have? Okay, Ashwin. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, why is it, uh, what are the reasons why the karmic connection between uh, parents and children are so strong that if we do a non-virtue towards our parents, it's particularly bad. Think about it. Think about it. Are they the same as just any Johnny down the street, you know? Are your parents just the same as anyone? A neutral person in the street? Yeah, they're the same in not wanting happen, not wanting suffering, wanting happiness that way, yes. But in terms of their connection with you, are they just anybody? No, right? If you look at how parents, most parents take care of their children, however, whatever problem we have with them later, you know, but uh, most parents involved, first you have a karmic connection with them, otherwise you wouldn't have, the bardo being would not have gone and joined with the sperm and egg of your parents, right? From the Buddhist point of view, you have a karmic link with your parents, you, there is a connection. Uh, then, they, then they took care of you for heaven's sake. When we were just a blob of uh, flesh that produced kaka and pee pee and wanted milk all the time. And they did that for months and years, especially the mother maybe. <clears throat> so of course we have a, of course they're more important. How could they not be more important, even if we hate them? Or have a very strained relationship like many of us do. So how can they be just the same as other people? No way. So there are powerful comic objects. So are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, obviously, because of uh, their compassion and uh, their being actually like the ultimate sort of mother, father. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are like ultimate <laughs> mother, father who care for us, it is said, more than our parents do because they have a deeper understanding of our pain and our suffering and so forth. Yeah, so that's why your teachers, your parents, the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, anybody who you feel you have a strong connection with, your, your brother, sister, whatever. And then, um, but uh, parents especially because uh, <clears throat> And I, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine, well, both, although the mother has more of a role, doesn't she, more work involved, usually, but the father also, because of the karmic connection, it's not just an accident that your father is your father, karmically speaking, so therefore, they also are a powerful object. Yes? So interestingly, I was reading somewhere among all the species. All the? All the species. 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 Human beings are the most vulnerable because our parents are actually, they, they take a brief, we up to take a long piece yes. of nurturing from That's our parents. Right. Yes. So from a compassion point of view, mm. we are really indebted to our parents and both, both the parents actually because yes. they support us for really long. I mean, look at any other animal. Exactly. They do not have this long stretch of the time till we so called stand on our feet. Yes, yes. So that's an enormous debt. It's not just merely giving birth. Yeah. This farm. Yeah. It's being pointed out that of all the mammals, all the animals, human beings have to nurture their children for the longest period of time because we are helpless for so long. 
unlike certain other animals who kind of pop out of the womb or whatever and just start bouncing around, you know, like, uh, is it uh, kangaroos? Cow, buffalo. Cow, buffalo. Uh, other, of course, they're looked almost after. All almost all of them. Almost all of them, according to Vishad Bhai, uh, just sort of, uh, g g you know, get on with it. But uh, human beings, as we know, I mean, I don't know, you may not have seen parents at work because you don't remember your own childhood so well, but I've seen my brother and sister-in-law at work and wow, it's hard work, especially the uh, very small infant, just helpless. He's just a producer of, uh, you know, gurgling and uh, burps and kaka pee pee and crying and keeping you up at night and uh, night after night or, you know, merrily sleeping in the day and <laughs> keeping the parents awake at night. So then, I don't know, was that your experience, Navinji, as a father? Yeah? Yeah, sleepless nights for sleepless. months. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and you probably didn't think of throttling your children too often, maybe <laughs> once or twice. But no, not at all. Not at, not all. at all. So, wow, not look at time. that. You certainly deserve the uh, appreciation of your daughters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they're powerful objects, very powerful objects. Or well, sometimes it seems like grandparents are more. Uh, compassionate but uh, parents yeah Kabirji uh, perhaps uh, Ashwin also uh, was alluding to the fact that every sentient being at some point or the other would have been a parent and hence there is some equalizing happening I, I don't know whether he also meant that when he was thinking about is there any difference between uh, that what you meant Ashwin ji were you referring to that particular teaching as well? All sentient beings are your mother, have been your mother? Uh, no, I wasn't referring to that, but I think it's an interesting point. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, very... Uh, yeah, but there's good mother, bad mother, all of that going on in our heads, right? So we have to separate the mother who is the ob karmic object who is worthy of being helped and uh, you know being uh, you know, kind to but then for our own sake sometimes we have to uh, yeah be clear with our parents that uh, we are not children anymore and as Khalil Gibran says in his great book the prophet in his chapter on parenting I think he says uh, there's your your children are not your children. They are life's, what is it, yearning for itself, something, some beautiful words there. But your children are not your children. He, he is saying to parents, you know, they come through you. They are not yours. They're coming through you. That's all very well. But still one has a, a big karmic debt to them for providing us with this precious human life. That's the point, precious human life when we were struggling to find a place to be reborn in the bardo and through sheer karmic good luck you could say we we found our parents <coughs> and human parents they're not frogs or spiders or fish dogs Dog may be better rebirth than fish, not sure. I think better. Dogs in the street in the mornings, they seem very eager to uh, have company sometimes. <clears throat> and they respond to affection. Fish, I'm not sure. Maybe they do. Dolphins probably do. Anyway, yeah, parents, very important. Objects. Anything else? Wow, it's 10 past eight. Time flies when you are having such great fun. So, okay, we can stop there. I think we Guruji. have some... Hello. Guruji, can I say one line? Ah, one line only, yes. For our Bodhgaya Yeah. Some 
Sometimes I feel like I have made mistakes and then remember my uh, wrongdoing and then I go to do compassion. Mm. Then I just like thinking that I'm shouting like whole 10 direction is listening and Buddha Bodhisattvas are listening. This is okay to do that? No, of course. They are listening anyway, probably. But I imagine like all the 10 direction, my, my sound is going in the all the 10 direction and everybody's listening, my confession. I this think is you okay? Should a, you should be a politician then. <laughs> you want everyone to hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, Rajeshi. Yeah, that's very good, I would think. The Buddhas appreciate uh, being spoken to and uh, being acknowledged. Not that they need it, but they're happy when we're doing that. Yeah, that's what Lama Zoprimbache says. No, he's always talking of ten direction Buddhas and this and that. I mean, Lama Yeshe always said, "Think big, right?" So thinking big is good. Yeah, very good. Rejoice! I always rejoice. You're in Bodh Gaya. I hope to see you soon. Yeah. Yeah, I I wish I wish also. Thank you. That's a good servant. You are a good servant. <laughs> Chalo, ji. So anything else? Okay, so thank you due to the combined effort of all of us, the dependent arising. Uh, the kindness uh, of everybody, we can have sessions like this, which are benefit uh, because we are looking at such an amazing text. So there's great benefit. I think just thinking about the text, let alone reading it and discussing it, that's very, very amazing. Well, not many people in the world are doing this, so uh, it's fantastic. We should rejoice at that, really rejoice that uh, by being here at Tushita, the four people at Tushita, five, including myself, and um, all of us online, uh, you can, I give you a view of who's here, so you can see the Rishad Bhai in yellow, and uh, friends, so I'm so embarrassed for getting people's names again, and again, and again. Uh, Akash, uh, it begins with A, your name. What is it? Huh? Arhan. Anand. Anand, I got the A right. Okay, and uh, yes, Sonal. Kunal, 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 Chunyi Kunal, who used to work at Root Institute, and also uh, Namita worked at uh, Root Institute. So she survived just. Yeah, so you, you will also survive, Rajesh Bhai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just. Okay, so we dedicate for the long life of our teachers, because without our teachers, uh, you know, the realized teachers, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be able to really understand what's going on. They give us also an amazing example of so, uh, cherishing others, dedicating their lives for others. How wonderful. Then please uh, dedicate that we are never separated from the authentic uh, dharma, Buddha dharma. All our teachers have long and healthy lives. All their wishes are fulfilled. The Dharma remains in the world for a very long time. And uh, we should, uh, however, you know, whatever is happening in our lives, and many things happen, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, stress or confusion, or whether it's joy, whether it's good luck or bad luck, uh, we can still aspire that um, our life is always meaningful for others. We should pray that our, our being around is beneficial for others. This is how the uh, how Shantideva also <laughs> and other bodhisattvas they dedicate. Yeah, that whoever looks at me, thinks of me, all of that, whether they like me or don't like me, hate me or you know praise me or or, uh, or abuse me, whatever, may it be beneficial for them. May it create the cause for them to attain highest enlightenment. So that kind of thinking is amazing because it creates the cause for us to actually be beneficial for others. Then we can be in a situation where sometimes people say, wow, I, I just, you know, just your presence, uh, I just like you being around, that kind of thing. 
and it can happen with people you've hardly ever met but they just you know benefit from your presence and this creating these kind of prayers creates the cause to be like that for others comforting for others this is very important a lot of uh, sadness and fear and discomfort isn't there and um, anxiety and confusion in the world so if we can be a little bit uh, comforting for others like a lamp like an island as shantideva says a bridge a servant even like bedding for others may we be like that for others <clears throat> that's why Lama Zubrimbache also he surrounds himself sometimes when he's teaching with teddy bears and stuffed toys you know he's like may I be like a you know kind of a comforting teddy bear mother for for, for others you know kind of soothing for others so anyway may his holiness Dalai Lama and Lama Zubrimbache all the other great lamas uh, live uh, very long lives may Tushita Delhi and all the other centers in India uh, have great uh, progress, good fortune, and all the other centers in the organization. <laughs> uh, may we always remember and be grateful to, grateful to our uh, spiritual masters. Uh, through whose kindness we develop 